Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey, Sean, thank you so much for the opportunity to interview you. Pleasure. So the audience that never you know, met you before, can you share a little bit about yourself? Um, kind of a self-made entrepreneur, uh, was really driven by my father who was an entrepreneur. Unfortunately, I lost him at the age of 57. He had his own uh, printing business where he supplied plate and film to the printing industry. So that's kind of in my, in my uh, DNA as far as direction of where I've taken my businesses uh, in the digital printing world and printing world itself and just really established uh, a stronghold in being uh, a developer of new products in innovative ways and technologies and uh, dabbled in a few restaurants and so I've been around the block. I've had some success stories and I've had some failures and learned from that so it's, a, it's been an exciting journey so far. Yeah, that's awesome and I love to hear some of that story. So like you said earlier, like you're one of the, the pioneers of digital print, right? So when you think about print, you know, you don't think a lot about technology or anything, but print industry has come a long way. Absolutely. There's so much going on in that space. And for those folks that uh, kind of understand a traditional way as far as printing, it's pretty much kind of a consolidated industry. And not only that is you start to see some of the folks that have just really dissipated or either sold to other larger printing companies like our Donnelly and a few of the larger corporations. But uh, the traditional way is pretty much gone by the wayside to some degree. Uh, when you get to the shorter run digital, and that's really where I kind of focused on. I kind of uh, started out with some of the manufacturers as far as uh, developing their digital technologies, whether it be color or just actual digital print. And I saw that um, there was a need for that. And especially one of my focuses is on one-to-one -one marketing and really understanding the data and how you can kind of parlay that into kind of a, a continual cycle. So I got involved and created Creative Digital Color, which is a one-to-one -one marketing uh, direct mail shop probably 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I was definitely a pioneer. And at that time, uh, we had uh, digital presses from Kodak and Heidelberg that were really entering into the space. They didn't really know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they were using thermal wax and, and uh, inkjet wasn't really evolved at that time. But um, you know, I was trying to educate my customers mm -hmm. on the value of what they had with the data. A lot of the guys would collect the data, whether it's the CEO or whoever, and they're like, all right, what do we do with this? Mm -hmm. It's great with numbers. But uh, through my intervention and in educating, uh, whether it be Bally's Health Club or whether it be uh, Walt Disney or Leo Burnett as far as a marketing company, now we have the ability to take uh, the data and create marketing pieces that are one-off. What I mean by one-off is I always use the analogy of like take your laser printer mm -hmm. and as you print a document, each one of those pages are unique to itself. So then I said, now put that on a thousand pounds of steroids. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a four color digital printer that prints out fast and prints out unique. So now each piece is tailored to that individual, whether it was demographics or you know, whether it was through um, individuals as far as um, ethnic backgrounds or whatnot. So now I could tailor that specific, whether it's product, vehicle, uh, vacation, or what have you to that individual. So now it's more tailored to them and I was able to, whether you're using a QR code or some time that hashtag, or whether it be a URL, I had some way of kind of tracking that data, whether it's a survey or even coming into a store for a coupon. So I had a lot of access. I, I must honestly say, Sam, I was pretty much ahead of my time mm -hmm. at that uh, point and um, you know, lived it for about five years, you know, had various partners. I had a lot of experience ups and downs. But I, I tell you, I wouldn't give it up for anything, but it's, it's not for, for the week. And uh, you know, with my employees, it was always uh, kind of driven on performance base. Mm -hmm. I gave them always the tools and the ability to learn uh, all the pieces of equipment so that, that they had the ability to whether stay with me because they enjoyed it or they could move on to other locations. I mean, there's a certain threshold of salaries that you can afford. and. You know how that goes when people mm -hmm. find out you're good, they want to they want to take you from there. But uh, it was a very successful company. Uh, did a lot of road shows for various manufacturers to talk about the industry. So the traditional people that were looking to get into digital, at least they had a little understanding and knowledge of kind of the bumps and the hurdles that I went through. And mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, had some success stories and some failures along the way is too. So, but uh, it's definitely changed because the ability to have a short run, mm -hmm. uh, you have no obsolescence, you don't have product on the shelf, uh, it's cost effective, and the fact is now you have true data when you do a direct marketing piece, you have uh, an element tied to it to know if there was success to it. How has the technology and the internet changed the way the print industry is operating today? Essentially, um, I think it, it allows you, I guess, to, you know, to have the ability to do shorter runs on demand. Um, and uh, because of the, um, the internet itself, it, it allows instantaneous access uh, to information that you need to acquire. And uh, it has definitely allowed the digital portion of the printing industry to uh, be able to turn around information that you're looking at at the internet to provide that back to you, whether it's a brochure or a survey or a coupon instantaneously, whereas in a traditional way, uh, it took a lot longer to create those marketing programs mm -hmm. and uh, was more involved where this way, um, being the fact that you had digital equipment, allows quicker turnaround. Plus the personalization capability, right? So because you're doing data collection, uh, the information, the data already probably was available to these marketers and businesses, but they were not able to incorporate that into their marketing initiative, especially in the print space. Now with the, with the digital, they have the ability to personalize almost every touch that they have with, the, with their end customer. Absolutely, you bring up a valid point. I think the digital uh, technology is probably like maybe 15, 20 years, uh, but you, you see kind of like four, people in the forefront like myself mm -hmm. that really introduced it to some of the major marketing companies. Um, you really had no avenue to really take that data mm -hmm. and really expose the one-to-one -one or the individual or a zip code or a town uh, to specific um, segmented uh, products. Mm -hmm. So um, as the technology and the speed and more and more major manufacturers are developing, whether it's inkjet or toner-based equipment, it allows them uh, to get that message out a lot quicker. So yeah, it has definitely changed within, I'd say, 10 to 15 years, mm -hmm. where even some of the traditional printers are now looking at, like, you know, how do I look at other vertical markets and how do I generate revenue because mm -hmm. the revenue is down from the traditional manner of, of communication so, to the masses. Now I've got the ability to communicate on a one-to-one -one level. So there's a lot of talk conversations around smart packaging and all sorts of stuff like that. Talk to me a little bit about what, it, what exactly is smart packaging and, and, and what, how, how do you leverage that from a sales and marketing standpoint? Absolutely. Um, and it's smart packaging, as you probably Google it, it's a very new technology. I mean, the technology's been there, but it's new for adapters to take a look at it because of uh, the involvement in really educating the manufacturers and how they could use it is a value tool, and what I mean by that is you can either incorporate really two technologies. There's other technologies that are printed, but there's near-field communication, NFC, which is a chip with an antenna, and there's RFID, radio frequency ID. Let's start with RFID. RFID is basically a computer chip with an antenna, just like you, your, radio, your radio, you turn it on, you get a signal, same thing, there's a wavelength, and, and depending upon maybe how far you away from the antenna, whether you're listening to WLS in your Wisconsin, you might not get that, uh, that WLS uh, up in Wisconsin. The same thing holds true to whether it's active or passive when you look at RFID, um, meaning that active, there's actually a source of energy that's sending out a signal to antennas. So for instance, Walmart was an early adapter of wanting the manufacturers to apply RFID labels mm -hmm. to the actual, say, a skid of pamper diaper. So as it comes off the trailer, uh, it's shrink wrapped and there's a label on it. It says there's 60 cases of large pamper diapers that would go by these two antennas. And as it went by, it would signal and say, I've got 60 large pampers and it would go to inventory. So what does that mean? Human intervention mm -hmm. is not there. Now it's electronic data. And again, there I go back to the sense of data mm -hmm. and it's uh, instantaneous and it's accurate. Mm -hmm. So as the diapers go in, they go to the warehouse, they go to the shelf, from the shelf it goes to the counter, it gets scanned, and as they realize 10 diapers went out, you're telling the stock boy to go back, stock the shelf, 
and then he realizes, he doesn't realize, but the system, mm -hmm. like whether it's an SAP or whatever system, it's collecting all this data from the RFID chips, saying, hey, Kimberly Clark or whoever, we need to order another truckload of diapers. So the human element is eliminated, but why that didn't take off, and that was probably like about eight years ago, is because that cost of the chip and the antenna that was applied to the label was transferred to the consumer and mm -hmm. it just didn't go. But as you're asking, you've got the conventional digital print goes to digital, costs have come down, run. The same thing applied for the RFID antenna and chip. Now you can apply an antenna and a chip much more cost effectively than you, you did before. So you'll start to see more and more RFID and NFC. And that's what we uh, really uh, consider smart packaging is because, again, collecting the data, but one of the strongest elements is we're taking a human person out of it to instead of 17, it was really seven cases and mm -hmm. inventory control that goes back to the manufacturer. So it's really kind of a, a complete circle in how you manage that and apply that. So as early adopters with digital, these are other tools that they can apply for future re revenue streams and just uh, um, applying that technology, which takes a whole group of folks. Mm -hmm. Like you're involved here with collecting data and giving that data back and showing how successful, whether it was an e email campaign or whether you sent out a video to an individual, did they click on it? Again, same principle applies. You're collecting that data and you're giving it back to that individual in a different manner, but again, it's all about data. So you'll see more and more uh, smart packaging, whether it's applied to a box mm -hmm. and it's maybe got a certain message or even you're applying your cell phone, which actually has uh, NFC capabilities. Mm -hmm. Android has it open as far as an open architecture. Apple has it closed. For example, if you go to pay for your credit card or you get a soda pop and you kind of see those half moons, mm -hmm. that's the NFC where you take your phone and directly connect it or contact it to the actual source, the antenna. Mm -hmm. So as I'm going back, RFID is more of an open architecture where it's kind of waves that will pick up, whereas NFC is a near field con So you're actually connecting, whether it's a label or a box, to a source, which is usually a cell phone, mm -hmm. which has tighter security. So people are more opting for the NFC than the RFID, but it depends upon the need of security and what level you're at, like especially when you're dealing with a credit card or you're dealing with anything with a cell phone, you want the direct connect, because unfortunately there's individuals out there that want to mm -hmm. collect the data and there's ways of easily collecting it from an RFID source versus an NFC. So that area is up and coming mm -hmm. and you'll, you'll see more and more major manufacturers applying NFC. I think Orioles did a, a package with NFC, a mm -hmm. little bit more expensive, but the results that they got was substantially higher when they had a giveaway when you touched your phone to the actual Oreo uh, uh, bag of mm -hmm. uh, cookies. So it, it, there's a lot of different uh, technologies and, and uh, features that you can apply to it. So it's definitely evolving. Makes sense. So as, as smart packages are coming to, you know, becoming more economical, there, you're going to see a lot more engagement even before the consumer ever consumes the product, even at the, the checkout counter or even in the in the aisles, they're able to probably find more information about how to use that product or how to enjoy that particular product, things of that nature. I'm assuming those are kind of ways that smart packaging is gonna help. Right, just like traditionally before, you might see a URL or a QR code, now you're gonna actually see where you touch the phone to, for instance, there's a bottle of wine and they have NFC chip in it. I can't remember the name of the manufacturer, but it gives you, you know, what to pair the wine with, mm -hmm. what the ingredients, what the calories, because as you see the ingredients get larger just so that people can actually see it. Um, because they're larger, they can't put as much information on mm -hmm. it. So now they're utilizing other tools where that you can, again, before you even consume or even look at the product, now you have the ability to mm -hmm. know what the ingredients are by touching the phone to the NFC chip and getting as much data. And then from there, mm -hmm. you know, there's different sources, whether it's video, whether there's coupons, it's more informative because you have the ability to, and, and also you have the ability to change the data. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I use uh, a URL or I use a QR code on a printed product, you don't it's permanent. It. Yeah. Now with NFC, I have the ability to change the message 
instantaneously. And I'm assuming brands and uh, brands and you know marketers have much more access to how the consumer is inter in interacting with these products on the shelf as well. So the in amount of people that are probably scanning it, how they used it, all sorts of information is probably being also collected, right? Absolutely, upsell, cross sell. Mm -hmm. So it, but because it's so new, it's you know when you're involved with a company such as yourself that's on in the, in the technology and up on the time, uh, you want to get involved with somebody because there's 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 more to collecting mm -hmm. that data and understanding that and know how to utilize it Correct, yeah. to really communicate further with the end user, the consumer. So going back to your, you know, your obviously the entrepreneurial career, career. Just talk to me a little bit about some of the lessons you've learned building. You've had restaurants, multiple restaurants, and successfully ran in Chicago market. You also had the print company. You've ran a lot of things. You've grew up under a dad who actually was running a business. What are some of the lessons you know learned by building building a couple of those businesses? Um, valid point, and you know, uh, I'm probably guilty of this even with my own children as far as. Uh, and not really to stereotype, but you know, I, I think the harder you grow up and the more that you have to provide for yourself, I think the more eager you are to I kind of be an entrepreneur or work harder. And you know, essentially when I had businesses, it's you, you want to build them up to look at the future, maybe to leave it for your children or to have something for the future. But um, you're kind of wearing multiple hats when you're kind of an entrepreneur like that, and uh, it. It depends upon whether you have a partner or you don't have a partner. I think I've learned a lesson that do as much as you can by yourself um, because there's, I'd say it's far and few individuals out there that really dedicate themselves to building a business from scratch. It's almost like taking a baby and nurturing it from being a baby all the way up to an adult. Um, you spend a lot of time and when you have that devotion, you feel that way. Uh, I think you have a tendency to be more successful and I think when you take the money put it back into the business whether it's through education or whether it's through training and, and focusing on the employees I, I, I think it has the ability to build whether it's a strong restaurant or a strong business and uh, I think if there's any advice um, is if you can try to do it by yourself to some degree uh, I would focus on that to have the majority and then um, also with good employees is provide them with a small percentage of the business because there's a lot more dedication and I think having the ability to recognize those folks I think is very important uh, and you'll recognize that right away when you see how hard people work and, and the devotion and uh, sometimes I almost look at it's a, a different era kind of there's a somewhat of an entitlement I think uh, as far as my parents and how they were brought up and how hard they worked and they provided for their family uh, kind of rolled over to me but I think the next generation I think they need to tend to um, maybe take the blinders off or really dive into if they really want to be an entrepreneur and, and, and look at a business and it, it's, it's not for the faint of hearted uh, but you definitely have to have the dedication or at dedication to, to wanting it and also you have to have a, a, a fantastic spouse. So uh, I'm going on 30 years, September 16th, being married and uh, you have to have a good partner and I mean a sense of marital partner if, if you're married at that uh, because they got to be understanding and, and being willing to understand that you're working hours, you're working weekends but you're building a future uh, for not only her or him but your children. So. Uh, and there's multiple lessons to be learned, but I, I think it's just being transparent and being honest is uh, I think how I've been successful and true to not only owning a business, but even now being involved in selling capital equipment, I can walk in the door of any of my previous customers or new customers and uh, just be transparent with them. I think they, they appreciate that value. So obviously you had restaurant businesses and then you, you ran a print shop and now you're working for a, a pretty massive manufacturing company that makes printing equipments, um, a German-based company. Yeah. So what are some of the lessons you learned that were unique from a restaurant, running a restaurant versus a print company and now um, you know, working for a corporation? Well, first off, I could really um, look at it from a standpoint of employees, mm -hmm. from that standpoint, whereas in the restaurant business, I, I don't know if it's probably the right term, but more transient because mm -hmm. of 
you know, some of the benefits, the health insurance and, and really the, 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 the cost of employment as far as, you know, employees' wages mm -hmm. are uh, minimal. And um, not that I'm uh, offending everybody, but as far as the skill level is a little bit different mm -hmm. from uh, a restaurant to an actual digital printing company mm -hmm. uh, from that standpoint. More stability within uh, a, an operation like that versus a restaurant. So you tend to see a lot more turnover mm -hmm. uh, in a restaurant from that standpoint than you do in a digital printing or for a printing company itself like that. You have more benefits to offer where in the restaurant you don't. So from looking at it from that standpoint, there's other areas, but just from employment, uh, there's a different ratio there. But one thing when you get into the, the printing aspect is now you start to see where um, a lot of the vocational schools are not offering printing or they're not offering that technology. So you don't see a lot of uh, employment there because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of skilled labor. You start to see them retiring and a lot of older people in a conventional way. But where you do see a lot of strength is, is folks that understand the computer business or computer itself because all the digital equipment as far as in the digital printing allow itself for, for that uh, generation uh, to run that type of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so from that standpoint, uh, those are kind of the two differences as far as when I look at it from a, a, a larger standpoint is really the employment is different and, uh, and from that aspect of it. So you, obviously you, you built a lot of businesses, you worked in the corporate world. What are some time management skills that you learned um, in making sure that you can be productive and you can also have a real life. Good point. Uh, well, it, from the, the re restaurant standpoint, uh, obviously you, you had your hours, you had to manage the schedule when you were available, whether it was a bartender, whether it was a server, or whether it was a busboy or the cook. So you know, that was on a weekly basis and it went out every like week to two weeks as far as a schedule and when you talk about time management. Um, in, in terms of from the printing business, my focus is more on process and procedures and cross-training. I did the same thing mm -hmm. as far as cross-training so they understood the different areas within the restaurant, but I didn't really have a cook go to a busboy and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. But in the printing business, I wanted to make sure that they understood how to do files and manipulation and color and running the presses and, and doing finishing to the actual printed pieces like that. So. Uh, I think from that standpoint, there was more focus on the printing industry as far as process and procedures because if a meal was late, that's all right. Maybe I gave them a free soup or I did something, that's it. If the project from the printing business was late or it got screwed up, it was much more costly mm -hmm. to me as the owner. So as you put process and procedures in place, you had checks and balances that as you started the job and you finished the job, mm -hmm. you would just simply check off. And, as you got proficient, you might not need that checklist, but in the beginning, you'd step one, two, three, four, A, B, C, and D. You knew that the job was gonna be done right, it's gonna be folded right, it's gonna be mailed right, the postage, and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. So th there are, I think, vast differences between mm -hmm. uh, the, the operations where there was, I'd say, less reliability, and the only time management was making sure that your employees showed up on time and that mm -hmm. they showed up, whereas in the printing industry, there was more focus on on the job itself because you mm -hmm. needed to, to get out on time and make sure that the job was done properly. And when you put those process and procedures in place, then you could really base a, a performance mm -hmm. and, a, and a bonus off of that for your employees. So the better job they did, the less they, let's just use the word screwed up, mm -hmm. the more that they had at the end of the quarter and less money out of my pocket from mistakes, the more money went back into their uh, in pocket. It was, it was a very, um, it was a good program for me and the employees enjoyed it because really they focused to get the job done properly and on time. Mm -hmm. So if you had to do it again if in terms of studying, I know you told me you want to go back into the restaurant business again and you love doing that. So if you had to do it again, what, would, what are some of the things that you would do differently now that you have some real life lessons building a couple of businesses already? In, in terms of the restaurant, as you probably are well aware of, I enjoy talking to people. I like meeting people. Uh, life is too short, so you got to enjoy it. Uh, I would definitely, if I ever got back in the restaurant, I would definitely be self-supportive. And uh, I know my sons, and I have a daughter. I don't want my daughter in it, but my two sons, they love to cook. 
They have uh, talked about uh, as they became successful, and one's in accounting, another one's in business, and he'll probably be an entrepreneur himself. I would definitely get into business with my sons, and that would be it. Because you, you definitely, you can rely on one another. Mm -hmm. It's sometime, uh, I look at the root of all evil is money, or mm -hmm. the greed of money. It's not really been my, I enjoy it because I like giving out, but um, I would be self-supportive and make sure that uh, my children were involved in it, that uh, I had some legacy to leave. And uh, because I've had multiple restaurants, uh, I kind of know the ins and outs of inventory and management and systems and that. So I, I made those mistakes along the way. So with, with this next entry into the restaurant, if my children choose to do that, I think we'll be about 85, 90% there as far as a perfect operation and knowing how to manage it properly and knowing the, 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 the pitfalls and, and the walls to, to either walk over or climb over. So. so obviously you've been in the space, you've seen a lot of changes happening in the industry, both on the restaurant space and how people process orders today, how they book their, you know, their tables and, and now you don't even have to have a, a waiter come to you, you can almost pay pay your bills right at the desk or you pl place your order, walk in, the food is already ready. I mean, there's so much changes happening in the restaurant space and you've seen so much trans transformation happening in the technology with regards to technology and, and internet in the, the print space. What, where do you see in the next five to 10 years, these two industries that you've had a lot of experiences, what, what kind of predictions you might have? Or what, what might come for us? Well, that's a loaded big question and I don't think we have enough time, but as you mentioned, the inter internet of things, IOT, uh, I mean, I hate to even admit it, hopefully someone's not watching this, but I could literally sit in bed and, and conduct business, whether it's through Dropbox with having all my documentation, whether it's through you know, sending a wireless communication to my printer and having it printed down in my office downstairs. I think the advent of the digital technology is without a doubt, it's, it's creating a, a different paradigm shift even mm -hmm. with interaction with individuals, but the ability to have instantaneously, like you said, orders or sitting still back in your bed and ordering breakfast and having Grubhub, uh, mm -hmm. you know, deliver your, your goods. It's, it's, uh, it's creating an environment that it's really about, I think there's some involvement with Big Brother, but it's all again, getting back to data, mm -hmm. is how can I can control that data? How do I understand that data? And how do I, uh, you know, give, whether it's the manufacturer or the individual, the proper data and how they could utilize it to not really benefit themselves, but provide the right service, the right products, and the right details to that individual. And I think that's where I see um, communication and interaction is gonna be much, much more personal. Just like you said, is I could walk to the restaurant, already have my order in the kitchen, sit mm -hmm. down, and within five minutes have it delivered. So uh, those um, features are gonna be much more easily accessed mm -hmm. as far as whether it's a restaurant and even in the, in the printing industry and the communication and uh, uh, whether it's texting or whether it's emails, it's just a whole different shift. But you know, where do I see a, a definite growth in, as far as like kind of my side of things as far as the, the printing and the digital is definitely with smart packaging. Mm -hmm. Is I'm going to have the ability to understand who's buying. I'm going to have the ability to communicate with that package to you mm -hmm. on whether it's other offers or other manufacturers to either cross or upsell. I'm going to know your habits. I'm going to understand you, you know, the right way. And I think if as individuals or manufacturers or Google or Amazon can really take that in consideration as far as the privacy, that if you want that privacy, you have the ability but really to communicate when you want it, how you want it, and what you want it. Uh, I think that's going to be um, a significant uh, change, which is already happening right now. Mm -hmm. But as even in my personal email address, it's data king one to one. Mm -hmm. Data is going to be king and we're going to communicate you know, one to one. And it's, it's already happening and it's just going to uh, transform into faster, quicker, better ways of uh, obtaining. I mean, probably go to the hardware store, we don't even have to leave the house and they'll deliver it. I mean, you see Amazon delivering mm -hmm. product the same day and I'll admit it, I use it too. And so it's, how do we use that in a proper way and respect each other's you know, privacy? And I think if we do that properly, I think we'll, mm -hmm. 
with Harvest. What, what would you, what, what advice you have for someone who's kind of still stuck in the 1980s? They haven't, you know, they are using some of these things that you're talking about. They are pre placing orders on Amazon. They are buying food uh, through whatever those apps and have the food be prepared whenever, uh, before they even show up to the door, right? They're doing all of those things online, but they're still having adapted some of the other things in terms of building their business and marketing their business and doing running sales. What advice do you have for those guys? Wow, this might be a, another prompt question. Is you can't be all, do all, you can't be an expert is and not a salesperson, but you have to rely on somebody that understands that technology that can help you with that because as running a business, even myself, I would look at a you know organization such as yourself and you know help manage that aspect of it because my customers want to be in tune with what I'm doing and I want to be in tune with them of what's the next technology, what's the next evolution as far as print, how can they save money and time. So you want to look for either you bring it in house, which is going to be costly, it's going to be expensive, it's another endeavor, or you find an organization such as yourself to help grow that business, understand it, and be the expert, be the resident expert. Mm -hmm. That's really the advice that uh, as far as I tried to do it and the resources and the time, it just, it, it took too much because it, was, it wasn't my core business, mm -hmm. but I still wanted the data. I still wanted to bring those customers in, maintain them, and, uh, and obtain new ones. Yeah. So you, you need to look for an expert in that, and that's one area I'm not. Uh, but as long as I get that information, I think it's very powerful for me to build, whether it's a restaurant or whether it's a printing business. Yeah, and I think the, the truth of the matter is if you don't adapt, you're gonna be absolutely right. If, you can't if, afford to. Well taken, because even in my father's business, as traditional ways of doing things and supplying, that's all changed. Like, mm -hmm. he never, I mean, he wasn't even around with Amazon, but now you can even buy products that my dad was selling mm -hmm. online. And you really need to, you know, uh, whether it's Google or whatever your source of information is, you really got to be on top of it because mm -hmm. if you're not, your competitor's going to be on top of it and they're going to surpass you and run away. And I've seen that happen with traditional printing companies mm -hmm. that didn't adapt to digital labels or digital marketing or direct one-to-one -one marketing pieces. And now they're either sold out at a lower rate or they've closed their doors just because mm -hmm. they didn't adapt to that technology. And because some, some kid in the basement created a website that can sell you that same product, they don't need to come to your door, right? That's the change. Absolutely. Right. And the, the millennials and the, and the new generation, that's, they're developing these programs that they're instantaneously like, mm -hmm. you know, what is your problem? And the kid's gonna create a software and develop it and, and eliminate that pain. Mm -hmm. And you see that more and more even in our industry with automated color and automatic, everything's automated where you just send in a file, it automatically color corrects, automatically adds the data mm -hmm. and goes right to the printer. Final question, you think direct mail is here to stay? I think we talked about it earlier, but it, 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 valid point. I think without a doubt it's mm -hmm. gonna stay because mm -hmm. I think I just heard the other day that I don't know if it was AT&T or Sprint, now they're gonna make the robocalling, they're gonna eliminate that. So. The, Whereas before you had to opt out or opt in to mm -hmm. message or marketing and whatnot, now the actual telephone companies and the cellular companies are going to eliminate. So it's not even going to reach you. It's not you don't even have the ability to opt in or opt out. Mm. So I think from that standpoint, as far as a manufacturer trying to communicate or market to an individual, they need to find those sources. And I even do it myself. I look at the direct mail pieces all the time. I like that tangible mm -hmm. item being held, whether it's a coupon or whether it's a newsletter from my town or from a healthcare industry. I like to hold it. So direct mail is definitely, I think, the post office has got to get their you know what together because mm -hmm. the postage rate is just rising and rise. I think they, I don't know if they prioritize it, but I, I think they have to make a change in the post office and, mm -hmm. and try to, you know, keep those costs down so that folks, manufacturers, car dealers, healthcare, whatever, can still communicate with a, a direct mail piece. So it, I don't think it's, I, personally, I don't think it's ever gonna, but it's gonna be more and more personalized, mm -hmm. directed towards you instead of to the masses, without a doubt, and you'll Much see- Much more targeted and not mass, mass mailing, but very personalized based on your prior purchase history or your behavior of how you, maybe you, how you interacted with the smart packaging in the store. 
right? That you might get meals and things of that nature. I mean, they're going to know when the product's empty and they're mm -hmm. going to send you a coupon saying, hey, you know, your Lysol is empty. You might have to go and here's a coupon. <laughs> That's going to get to that level. That is so true. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you very much for having Thank me. Thank you for sharing some of those wisdom. Yes. Thank you. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.